Yo, yo, yo. Today, y'all, I'm going to be telling you guys the story of the atom. Let's start off with an analogy. <clears throat> A football team might practice and try different plays in order to develop the best possible game plan. As they see their results, coaches can make adjustments to refine the team's play. So what does this have to do with atomic theory? Well, science as we know it did not exist thousands of years ago. Power of the mind and intellectual thinking were used to solve life's many mysteries, like that of the nature of matter. The earliest conclusions were that matter was made up of earth, water, air, and fire. Ooh la la, yes, like the avatar nations. And that it could be endlessly divided. Very creative. But there's no way to test it out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So here comes along this dude um, named Democritus. He was the first to propose the idea that matter is not infinitely divisible. He says that matter is made up of these tiny individual particles called atomos. They cannot be created, destroyed, or further divided. He also stated that different atoms have different sizes and shapes. Amazingly ahead of his time, but no one believed him. And I don't blame them. Just imagine this old dude walking down the street. No, oh, there are these small, indivisible, uh, tiny, tiny atoms. And would you believe him? Right? More than 2,000 years would pass before anyone could prove his theory. So Aristotle was the uh, one that rejected Democritus' theory because it went against his own beliefs. And back then, he has a lot of clout, I would say. And so he would um, use that influence to push down other ideas that didn't align with his own. He said that matter is made up of earth, fire, air, and water. <laughs> no, since... Aristotle uses clout um, to bring down uh, Democritus. Now we can bring down Aristotle's belief because now we know that matter isn't just made up of these fundamental air, earth, fire, and water. So Aristotle's a fool. You guys can repeat after me. Aristotle's a fool. Aristotle's a fool. Aristotle is a fool. Aristotle is a fool. Okay. Moving on. So John Dalton, a school teacher, <laughs> yeah, he revived and revised Democritus' theory based on research he conducted. He studied numerous chemical reactions, making observations and measurements along the way. He was able to determine the mass ratios of elements involved. So here's Dalton's atomic theory. Matter is composed of small particles called atoms, so he may recognize it, atomos to atoms. Atoms are indivisible and indestructible. Atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and chemical properties. Atoms of a specific element are different from those of another element. Different atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. And finally, in a chemical reaction, atoms are separated, combined, or rearranged. So his theory helped prove the law of conservation of mass and is largely what we follow today, except for the two red flags here. Atoms are definitely divisible, and we will see that soon. Atoms of the same element can have slightly different masses, and we'll learn about that in the next lecture. So again, the law of conservation of mass is mentioned previously is that mass is conserved in any process. Matter is not created or destroyed, they are simply rearranged. Remember, chemical reaction I define as um, just atoms breaking apart, then finding new partners. As we see here, atom A and B, they combine together to create the compound of element A and B. So we've been talking about atoms so far, but what is defined as an atom. So consider a gold ring. Ground it, or grind it down into a pile of gold dust. 
each fragment of dust retains properties of gold, the luster, malleability, and melting point of it. So continue to grind down the fragments into particles. The smallest particle that still retains the properties of gold is considered to be an atom. So now that we're convinced atoms exist, let's investigate their structure. Let's talk about the size of atoms. They're very, very small. A pure copper coin the size of a penny would contain about 2.9 times 10 to the 22nd atoms. Let's put that into uh, the terms we would understand. Earth has about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 9th people. And so there are about 4 times 10 to the 12th more atoms in a little coin than people on Earth. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <sighs> We do have methods for seeing atoms, though, even though they're this small. So we know the atom exists, so which part of the atom is discovered next? That would be the electron, y'all. J.J. Thompson comes in with that discovery. He uses the cathode rays to prove the existence of negatively charged particles in all atoms. He also concluded that the mass was much lighter than a hydrogen atom, the lightest known atom we know. So what does this mean? This means that the electron is smaller than a hydrogen atom, which is just one proton, which we'll talk about later. So Robert Millikan performs the oil drop experiment to determine the mass to be 1 over 1840, the mass of hydrogen. Again, remember, smaller, the electron is smaller than the hydrogen atom. And with this discovered negatively charged particle comes a new model. And this model is created by J.J. Thompson, the plum pudding model. And this model, y'all, again, plum pudding is that uh, pudding thing on the left-hand side. Um, his drawing of the plum pudding model would be that there's a spherical cloud of positive charge, and within that jaw is embedded the negative electrons. So, we have new questions that arise from this model. If matter is neutral, and we know this, and electrons carry a negative charge, what maintains the neutral charge? And if the mass of an electron is so small, where does the rest of the mass come from? Good questions. To answer the question comes Ernest Rutherford and the gold foil experiment. So gold foil experiment is simply um, testing the idea of the plum pudding model. Uh, Ernest Rutherford wanted to take uh, a radioactive source and then it emits alpha particles and that alpha particle is aimed at a very thin foil. So alpha particles are large radioactive positively charged particles. And he aimed it at the gold foil. The gold foil is surrounded by screens that flashes when alpha particles hit. So again, you guys can see the film, um, the green film located all around that gold foil. And it's used to detect um, alpha particles, okay? So Rutherford predicted that as um, these fast-moving alpha particles were to go through the gold foil, um, the path of the alpha particles will only be slightly altered by a collision with the electrons. Okay, so straight line there. So what actually happened? Rutherford says, it's like firing an artillery shell at a piece of paper and that shell coming back at the canyon. So what observations did Rutherford make that made him come to this analogy? Well, the majority of the alpha particles went straight through the gold foil. That made him think one thing. And then what made him talk about this artillery shell firing back at the canyon is that these alpha particles were deflected at a very large angle. So what explains that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. So again, he concludes another thing, and we're gonna talk about the conclusions on the next slide. 
but the majority of it comes down to the plum pudding model could not be the correct model because it could not explain the results of the gold foil experiment. Considering properties of alpha particles and electrons and the frequency of deflections, Rutherford came to the following two conclusions. Number one, the atom is mostly empty space through which the electrons move. And number two, almost all of the mass and the positive charge is found in a tiny dense region in the center of an atom, which he called the nucleus. So the electrons are held in place by the attraction to this positive nucleus. So Rutherford's nuclear atom explains neutral charge of atoms, the protons, but does not account for the mass. So here comes along James Chadwick, and he discovers the neutron. It has the mass nearly equal to that of a proton, but carries no electrical charge. Last but not least, y'all, we've come upon our last model, our modern model, the electron cloud model. So the electrons are located in this cloud, the nucleus very, very center, protons and neutrons is what makes up the nucleus. So the properties of the subatomic particles, y'all, be sure to fill that information out. The electrons are located in the surrounding the nucleus, has a negative charge, and very, very small mass, smaller than the proton. So proton is in the nucleus with the positive charge, relative mass of one, and the neutron, no charge, located in the nucleus with the relative mass of one. Okay, y'all, that's it for today. Have a good one.